Hello, and welcome to episode 230 of The Modern Manager. I'm your host, Mamie Canfer stewart Today's guest is Dr. John Finn. Dr. John founded the award-winning Tougher Minds Consultancy and has three psychology-related degrees, including a PhD. He has worked in performance psychology, resilience, and leadership science for over 20 years. And he wrote his best-selling book, The Habit Mechanic, because his life's mission is to help people be their best in the challenging modern world. John and I talk about what it is to be a habit mechanic, why habits are so important, and the role of social acceptance in driving our habits. And of course, how to manage your super habits and destructive habits, and a whole lot more. Now here's the conversation. Thank you so much for joining me today, Dr. John. I'm super excited to talk with you about one of my favorite topics, habits, and how habits can help us be our best selves, all that good brain science, neuroscience, psychology, all that stuff that like helps us live our best lives and we can use to our advantage because we understand the brain in, in totally new ways than we used to. So thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you for having me, Mammy. It's a pleasure. All right. So let's start with this concept of a habit mechanic. It's in the name of your book and it's clearly really important. So what is a habit mechanic? Yeah, well, to understand this, we first of all, I think, just have to forget everything we thought we understood about habits because <laughs> pop psychology has done a really bad job at informing us about what habits are and what they aren't. We only about t- 25 years ago now could we start to see inside the brain in real time. And we've had uh, very, very, very prolific scientists like Daniel Kahneman, George Lakoff, really showing us just how automated our behavior is. So we've we've been conditioned to think about habits as it's maybe half of what we do, 50%, 40%. We think of habits as very physical things. It's what we eat. It's how we exercise. It's bad habits like smoking, picking your nose, whatever it is. But it turns out most of what we do most of the time is automatic or semi-automatic behavior. That, That means that what we think and what we do at least 98%, and that's minimal, 98%, sometimes it's 100%, is automatic. So in other words, it's a habit. So we are absolutely driven by habits. They are driving everything that we think and everything that we do. So they're fundamental to your belief systems, to how you speak to yourself, to everything you do in in any 24-hour period. And the challenge that we face in the modern world is that we are continually... The only, the only constant in the modern world is change. So we're continually being bombarded by new things. Where be it's, it's made easier for us to do more unhelpful things like worry too much, beat ourselves up too much, um, eat the wrong food, consume the wrong uh, media, procrastinate too much, etc. These are all these are all habits. So it's more important than ever to understand our habits and to be able to precisely start to recognize and analyze our habits, learn which is which are good and which are not so helpful, and then learn how to start building sustainable new ones. So a habit mechanic understands how their brain works. They understand the behavioral science that influences their behavior. They understand how to start analyzing their helpful habits first, their unhelpful habits or their super habits first, their destructive habits. And they understand how to how to build sustainable new habits so if you want your car repaired you go to a car mechanic who really understands the inner workings of the car engine and can be really precise about how they fix the car engine if we want to really be healthy happy and at our best in the challenging world that we live in we need to be habit mechanics does that explain the concept yes and actually that last metaphor makes perfect sense when you think about what you said at the beginning of a minimum of 98% of our thoughts, actions, right? How we exist in the world are habits that we really need to be a mechanic who understands the system and knows how to go in and precisely fix it. We can't just think about our habits as one-off behaviors here and there that, you know, we can design around. We actually need to think of it as a whole system. Exactly. And we need to go further. I was speaking to someone the other day, an expert, HR expert in the US, and they, they told me that some recent data, I think it's from the HR Institute, reported that only 9% of businesses 
felt that their performance management systems they used were positively impacting their people as they wanted them to. So only ninety, only nine percent, which is astounding. If you go to professional sport, for example, and you ask the, the sports teams, "How happy are you with your with the physical conditioning and fitness levels of your players?" I'm pretty sure you'd get over ninety five percent saying they're really happy. Why is that? It's because sport have taken sports science over the last twenty years and a bit longer and use that insight about how physiology actually works, about human biology. And they've used those insights to develop training and conditioning programs that actually adapt the athlete's physical condition to where they want it to be. When it comes to human thinking performance, we're feeling around in the dark. We're using these outdated black box theories some of them are over 100 years old, to inform our current practice. So it's no wonder that we're not actually able to help people to do better as well as we'd like to do. So for me, if we really want to understand the importance of habits, I think we've almost just got to cross out the word human from human capital and replace it with habits, habit capital. The most important resource in your business is not your people as you think of these logical you know, lovely people, it's their habits because their habits are driving everything that they do. We can get people to understand what they should do and they can agree that that's a good idea to do that. So we can get people to understand it's a great idea to eat five portions of fruit and vegetables a day and to walk 10,000 steps. And people say, yeah, I agree. That's a great idea, but people don't do it. And in the UK, for example, people don't do it to the extent that the National Health Service, which is the biggest company in Europe, spends over half its annual budget on treating diseases that emerge because people don't eat five portions of fruit and veg a day and they don't walk 10,000 steps. So we don't do what we know we should do. We do what we're in the habit of doing. So it's habit capital. It's, it's habit resources. They are fundamental to everything that we're doing. But because we're so automated, we don't see them. We don't understand them. Another famous American scientist Daniel Dennett it talks about, you know, you've got almost, well, you've got trillions of tiny mechanical, it's like you've got trillions of tiny mechanical cogs in your brain driving everything that you think and do. So Dennett kind of combined Charles Darwin's work and Alan Turin's work. But we're just, we're just being driven by these, this mindless uh, behavior. And we have this tiny, tiny bit of consciousness, which makes modern life really, really difficult. Well, I my my brain is like exploding right now, <laughs> just listening and thinking about all of all of this. And I'm wondering if you can share a little more about some of the ways that we've gotten it wrong. Like, what are some of the insights about the brain that like aren't actually true, or places where we get tripped up when trying to do behavior change or trying to build new habits? Yeah, I think fundamentally we get tripped up because we don't go back to the number one operating rule of, well, how do brains actually work and what influences what brains get good at, which is neuroscience and behavioral science. So it's like a rocket scientist not starting with the the basic uh, principles of physics to understand how to get the rocket in the air. Because for so long in the human thinking sciences, whether it's the psychology sociology, et cetera, we just haven't been able to look inside the brain. One of the stories in my book is Roger Bannister, who was the first guy to run the the mile in the four minutes. What many people don't know about Roger Bannister is that when he broke that record, he was training to be a medical doctor at Oxford University, but he was also a research scholar. And he was in the university laboratories getting people onto treadmills and he was analysing how much oxygen, or their, their gas exchange, as we call it in physiology, how they were using oxygen as they were running, essentially. And he was started to use those insights. That, so that told him how important oxygen was along this, or for the distance he was running. And he started to use those insights to inform his training habits. Bannister wasn't the only person trying to break that record. People have been trying to break it for 50-plus years. And there were two other prominent runners right at the same time trying to break it, but Bannister won because he used science. So back, so in the 
the the forties, we we got that ability to start analyzing the physiology of, of of human beings, and I suppose that's why physiology science is is, is so impactful in today's society. But we've had to wait until you know the sort of late nineties to early two thousands to actually start looking inside the human brain. You know, so we're sort of sixty plus years behind where the physiology physiology is. So we've got to start with the first principles of brain function. So what what things have neuroscience taught us that we didn't previously understand? Because some people just want to write off neuroscience. Yeah, it didn't really. It's not really taught us too much, has it? You know. Well, a lot of the neuroscience data is what we call confirmatory data. So it reinforces things we already understood, which is great. It's another source of of, of data that is telling us the same story. But it's. There's a few seismic things that have come out of neuroscience. One is neuroplasticity. Our brain is changing all the time. If you spoke to a top neuroscientist 25 years ago, they were pretty compelled that when we stopped physically growing, our brain stopped changing in, in any in any serious way. You know, so by the time you were know, 16. That you, you you got what you got basically. You were out. You were what you were, and you weren't going to be changing that much. So that's nonsense. Our brain is changing all the time. We have about hundred billion neurons in our brain. They're like plasticine. They change in accordance with what you practice. So if you practice worrying and beating yourself up lots, you grow lots of neurons in your brain for practicing uh, for for getting good at worrying and beating yourself up. So brains are changing all the time. If we look at Sort of modern standard management language. There's something called the sandwich technique for giving feedback, give them a positive, give them a negative, give them a positive. What neuroscience again has shown is just how powerful the negative is. So I'm sure some of the listeners are familiar with Barbara Fredrickson's work, Flourishing and Languishing, where she talks about we need a ratio of three positives to every one negative if we're going to be, in her language, flourishing. And that's a minimal ratio. Sometimes a negative is so heavy that we need 11 positives to kind of balance out, if you like. So the brain architecture we have isn't two to one, negative to positive, as the management technique suggests it is. It's at least three to one, and it's in reality a lot more than that. Our brain is wired for survival. That's what it's designed to do. And that's where we start to understand the importance of psychological safety, et cetera, coming in so so brains can start to work well. We understand that the brains, you know, the more we've studied, analyzed the brain, that the brain's number one operating rule is to save energy because for most of our existence, energy was a scarce resource. Now we have an abundance of food, but our brain still is caught up in the mindset of 300,000 years ago where we're hunter gatherers. And we saw this recently in the pandemic where the supermarket shelves emptied really quickly because people thought there'd be a lack of supply of things. So these are fundamental factors that drive behavior. So if I want to help someone to do better, I need to be using those first principles to inform the things that I coach them, support them, help them to do. And those understandings should be at the, the, the core of how we build culture, how we build teams, how we build better leaders, better managers, et cetera. Then you go into the behavioral science, which is another fascinating area. And I can't find, for example, just to show how complex this space is, I can't find one behavioral science expert out there, and there are many dispersed throughout the world, whose model explains everything about why humans do what they do, because that's the nature of academia. People get their their model, and they're incentivized to protect it and to kind of throw rocks at other people's models. So we've created our own our own uh, behavioral science model called a nine action factor model. And we sort of using all the different insights from the, the great academic experts we've got, but plugging all their theories together. So we've got, I think, something that explains much more coherently why people do what they do. Those factors are always on in your team, well, in your life, in your team, in your organization. If we understand what the nine factors are, and they're responsible for all the positive stuff that's going on and all the, neg- on, and all the negative stuff, if we understand what they are, we can get better control over them. So there's some sort of high level insights what the having mechanic approach and book and, and app and, and and training does is it shows you how to put all that stuff into practice so that 
it's easier for you to build and sustain helpful habits for yourself as a habit mechanic. But then once you can do that, you can become a chief habit mechanic. So you can help others to, by building great cultures, you can help others to build and sustain really helpful habits. I love this. And I want to lift up a couple things and and then dive deeper into one of them. So I remember when I was reading parts of your book that this energy con- conservation that the brain does can translate into us avoiding thinking. It's not just energy like conservation of the physical, like why I prefer to sit on my couch and watch Netflix instead of exercise at night. But it's also I want to avoid doing the hard thinking tasks because my brain is trying to conserve energy. And so I'm procrastinating instead of doing the thing I know that I should be doing. And to me, that was a a big thing. I mean, I've heard before around like, you know, you kind of feel it intuitively that thinking is hard and like, oh, it's a big task and it feels like, uh, but to actually know that our brains are are wired that way to say, yeah, I'm going to avoid that thing because it takes a lot of energy to do. And so I'm just going to maybe look over at that couch and think about how comfy it is. The other thing I wanted to lift up was, I think it was in the same section about Maslow's hierarchy, that we kind of got it a little wrong and that the need for social connection and social acceptance is really primary. It's not a a nice thing after food and shelter. It's actually kind of in the same vein as food and shelter. Am I remembering that correctly? Yes. So the parts of our brain that tells we're thirsty and we're hungry is hardwired into the part of your brain that tells you about social status. So it's fundamental. It makes absolute sense. Homo sapiens isn't the biggest, fastest, strongest animal on the planet, but we dominated it because we're better at any other than working intelligently in teams. Essentially, our survival as individuals is tied into the group. So if we're not liked by important people in our life, in other words, we get kicked out of the group, our survival chances go down, immediate survival chances go down. Also, our chances of passing our genes on go down. So we are hardwired to be silently concerned about what important people in our lives think about us. And I would, the way I think about it, and I've never heard anyone express it like this before, but this is, I'm pretty compelled. This is, this is, what, this is what drives our behavior. So again, if we, if we go back to what are we designed to do? Well, anthropologically, we'd, we'd, it looks like we're designed to walk about 12 miles a day. So we think we're designed to move around and solve problems. Problems, first of all, relating to threats. That could be physical violence threats. It could be you know, social status threats. So we're problem solvers. What does that really mean? It means we're trying to control our environment. So we're trying to control the world around us. And when we lose a bit of control, that's what causes a disconnect in our meaning systems. That's why we get a stress response. And I think there are two pillars that we're trying to control. One is our status. How do we look in front of other people? And the other pillar is feeling good, which is on a continuum of I'm, I'm dead all the way through to I feel great. So you're trying to control the world in relation to those two pillars. And that drives everything that we do. And that makes a lot of sense from a brain function perspective. So the thing that I want to go back to is the super habits and the destructive habits. I think you've mentioned it kind of very early on in this conversation. And I think it's really important for us to understand that not all habits are kind of made equally. So can you talk a little bit more about what super habits are and destructive habits are and kind of why they are so important? Yeah, so who knows how many how many habits are running what we what we're doing and thinking right now? Could be hundreds, could be thousands, could be tens of thousands. It's quite hard to define what what a what a habit is in that sense. But what we've learned over the last 20 plus years of helping people to build better ones is that some are more impactful than others, are disproportionately impactful. Super habits are disproportionately impactful in a positive way and destructive habits are disproportionately impactful in a negative way. So part of your journey to becoming, in fact, it's sort of the backbone to your journey of becoming a habit mechanic is to work out, well, what are my super habits? And you do this through what we call personal research, trial and error, et cetera. And how do I build more of those? And what are my destructive habits? And how do I get rid of those? An example of a super habit, so I've got these, they're the kind of the backbone of my day. Let me go to a less intuitive one. So at the end of my working day, I always write a written reflection. And we have 
something called the Habit Mechanic University app, which is a free app. It's a where habit mechanics get together. I might go in there and post my three to one daily reflection. So three things that have been positive or it's helpful to pay attention to that have happened that day. One thing I can do better in the next 24 hours. Or I might just start writing down all the helpful things that have gone on that day. Or I might go even further and do some expressive writing. But what I found is if I write purposefully at the end of the day, whether it's just a few minutes doing a three to one reflection or, or a longer form um, expressive writing exercise, that makes it easier for me to draw a line in the sand between work and life, to switch off, to activate my evening routines. I sleep better, therefore I feel better the next day, I'm more productive, etc. So just by doing that one thing, it has all these knock-on benefits. A destructive habit could be I finish work too late. So we know people are busier and feel like they're working longer hours than ever with their hybrid work place. So I'm I'm finishing work late. That's for me, this is the destructive habit. The, that then triggers I eat late. And because I eat late, I'm really hungry. Because I'm really hungry, I eat too much. And because I eat too much, I don't sleep very well. And because I don't sleep very well, I don't feel great the next day. And because I don't feel great the next day, that activates lots of other uh, unhelpful behaviors. And so the cycle goes on and I finish late again, et cetera. Then I start to gain work. So just that one thing of not finishing work on time and getting that balance right between what we call the three brain states has all these other negative uh, consequences. So if we can deal with that, we'll, we will indirectly start to deal with the other stuff as well. Do that make sense? Yes. And now I, I want to know, how do we identify what our super habits are or could be? And same thing on the destructive habits. How do we identify what our destructive habits are so that we can start to walk them back? Yeah, so it starts with intelligent self-watching. So, you know, a physical version of intelligent self-watching is stepping on this weighing scale. So you, you can have an opinion about your weight right now, but when you get on the scale, it's going to tell you much more accurately where it's at. Um, for me, often it's higher than what I think it is. But that's an intelligent self-watching exercise. Our habit equivalent of that, we've got lots of self-assessments we've developed that are all in the book. So you you start cycling through the self assessments and start thinking about yourself, about your habits in a in a in a different way to what you've thought about yourself before, and then you do some analysis. You target one particular thing to work on. You build a habit plan to help you to to work on that using a nine action factor model based habit plans. To try some things out for a while. At the end of the week, you do your habit analysis again, or the end of the month. Essentially, we've got all these habit analysis, habit building tools that we've got daily tools, we've got weekly tools, we've got monthly tools and, and longer. So it's just this cycle of, to discover our super habits and destructive habits, just this cycle of self-watching, targeting something to work on, making a plan. We call that a swap. You self-watch, you make an aim, you make a plan and you go on this journey. And by doing that, you're more self-aware and you're developing what we call your habit mechanic intelligence. And I'm still developing my habit mechanic intelligence. I've got three psychology related degrees, including a PhD. I've worked in these fields for over 20 years. I've probably spent over 25,000 hours designing programs, coaching, et cetera. And I'm still learning about myself and I'll, and I'll never stop. And I think that habit mechanic intelligence is the most important intelligence for, our, for us as individuals, for us collectively, if we want to be healthy, happy, and at our best. So, that's why I wrote the Habit Mechanic book. It isn't a normal book in the sense of it's one idea repeated 10 times. It literally is a manual for life. I was just saying at the start of the call, I, I pick this up every day and I wrote it because I'm just using it all the time to help me to be at my best. So if you want to discover your super habits, it's about going on that Habit Mechanic journey. The book's a great starting point. Join the Habit Mechanic University community. That's helpful as well. I love it. Well, then I think this is a perfect place to transition. So before we get to find out where people can get the book, can you tell us about a great manager that you worked for and what made this person such a fantastic boss? Yeah. Can I have two? Of course. I'll say it quickly. So one is a guy called Nigel Adkins, who's a professional football manager. He was my second boss in professional sport. He he is the archetype, what I'd call action communicator, which is one 
one of the four parts of our what we call our team power leadership model. So he's just really good at you know bringing energy to the situation. Really positive guy gets his gets his positive mask on etc. So he, he's a really impressive guy as a leader and as a manager, and he's had phenomenal success in in professional um, soccer in in the UK. The other person I'd say is uh, Professor Jim McKenna, who was my academic boss. I think he's unusual for an academic. He's, he's not. He's very much about everyone else developing and growing, and uh, helping them to supporting them to be at their best on their journey. And he's not so precious about his own journey. And that's not always what I've seen in, in academia. So yeah, I've learned a lot from those two guys, definitely. Awesome. And where can people get a copy of your book and learn more about you and keep up with all your work? Yeah, so Amazon's a great place to get it, as are, as are all the other major online book retailers. It's on physical book, ebook, audio book. I recorded the audio book. So if you like my voice, that's a positive. If you don't, it's probably a negative. <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm one of these people that listens to the audio book and then makes makes notes in the book, you know. But um, it's all there if you want to go check it out. And if you want to be healthy, happy, at your best more often, this is the toolkit. For me, there's nothing else out there like this. It's unique. And it's not only for you, it's to help you help your people as well. So everything you learn for yourself, you can use to help your people. You just pick it up, pick a section, and you know, in five minutes, you'll have some real simple practical science-backed things that you can be trying out and using to help you do better and your people do better. Yeah. And I'll give a shout out. There's a whole section in the book dedicated to helping your team members and helping your team collectively build good habits. So definitely a book that is supportive of you as an individual and of you as a manager of people. Well, thank you again so much for joining me today. I definitely learned a lot and have a lot more to learn, but I really appreciate the conversation. Well, thank you, ma'am. It's been a pleasure. And thanks to everyone for listening. If you have any questions, just reach out and I'm happy to help you further if I can. Dr. John is giving away 12 months of his premium subscription membership to At Your Best. This program will help you quickly learn how to feel better, do better, and lead better. Through it, you'll access a range of science-based tools that have already helped over 10,000 people change their lives. To be eligible to win, you must be a patron-level member of the Modern Manager community or participate in the Skills Accelerator and you must submit your entry by December 9th, 2022. To learn more about the Modern Manager membership or the Skills Accelerator, go to themodernmanager.com slash join. All the links are in the show notes, and they can be delivered to your inbox when you subscribe to my newsletter. Find that at themodernmanager.com. Thanks again for listening. Until next time. Meetings are one of the most critical components of healthy collaboration, and teams are at the heart of how we work. Meteor helps you use your time in meetings productively, build healthy relationships with your colleagues, and move work forward. To learn how we do it, visit meteor.com. That's M-E-E-T-E-O-R.com. You've been listening to The Modern Manager. You're already becoming a rock star boss of a thriving team, I can tell. To ensure you never miss an episode, subscribe to the show in your favorite podcast player, and join the mailing list at mamieks.com slash podcast. That's M-A-M-I-E-K-S dot com slash podcast to get show notes and other special content delivered directly to your inbox. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time.